You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. I'll read for us the scripture for this afternoon. So that's from Acts verse, oh no, no, Acts chapter 19, verse 21 to 41. So I'll just give you some time to flip to that page or to navigate on your app. Um, so Acts 19. Verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is a danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be dis- deposed in, in her, from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the, into the theatre. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does, who does not know the city of the Ephesians, is temple keeper of the great Artemis, and of the sacred stone that I fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemous of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to to justify this commotion. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? It's great to see you this afternoon. Welcome to RHC. Friends, why don't we pray for a second? Just ask God to open our hearts. Father, we come before you and we ask that you would be with us and meet with us today. Won't you minister to our hearts? Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Build us up where we need to be built up. We ask this in Jesus' name. So, what comes to mind when you think about Singapore? What's your relationship to Singapore like? How do you view it? There's a number of different ways that we can engage with Singapore. We can disdain it. Some people may resent the fact that you grew up here, not like it, not like the pressure that it's put on you, and really not have much time or affection for it. Maybe some are newer to Singapore and you're inclined to romanticize Singapore. You see all the shiny buildings and you just love it. It's so efficient 
and you just think it's the best place in the world. I sometimes still feel that way after living here for 15 years. Some of us may be inclined to use it, to use the city. We really don't care too much about it one way or another. We're just here to extract from it what we can. It's a great way for us to advance our career, to make money, to build our CV, but we really are just here to get what we can. We couldn't really care about what's happening around it. Friends, the scriptures urge us to love, to love and serve a city made up of people made in the image of God and to long for all of those inside of our city to flourish. The Bible tells us that this, the, the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our God. And one day God is going to renew Singapore and make it even more of a beautiful garden city than it is now. What Singapore is going to become is going to make what it is today look awful in comparison. And God is going to make this place to be a place where there is life and every person inside it flourishes and every tear is wiped away from eyes and everyone goes about their days worshiping and glorifying God. And this is surely going to happen. Now, because this is going to happen, our vision as a church is to see Asia renewed by people, churches, and cities transformed by the gospel. Now, how much of that we'll get to see in our day, I don't know. But we know that this will certainly happen one day when Jesus returns. And today, what we're going to see from Acts chapter 19 is that one of the best ways for us to love our city is for the Christians, you and I, who do believe in Jesus, if you're here and you're a Christian today, is to, for us to worship Jesus wholeheartedly, no matter the cost. The call for us today is not to look at our city and to criticize or to judge or to wag a finger. There could be a time and place for that at times. But this text is calling us to rejoice in Jesus and worship him and devote our hearts and lives to him and then to let the chips fall where they may. Now we're going to look at this text in four parts. Firstly, the good news that disrupts what we worship. Secondly, good news disrupts a city's systems of worship. And then we're going to see the good news is fruit is both resisted and recognized. And then we'll just ask, what does this mean for us? So let's dive right in. The good news disrupts what we worship. Paul comes to the city called Ephesus, where people are engaged in the city in all kinds of worship and magic and idolatry and twisted religion. Verse 19, we actually started our text a couple of verses earlier. Uh, it says, those who practice magic arts. There are those who engage in all kinds of different religions. We see the temple of Artemis there. And there is much worship and idolatry happening in the city. Artemis, uh, the temple to Artemis was, was this glorious building. I went to Ephesus about 25 years ago. You can still find the ruins of this temple there today. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. People would travel just to go and see how magnificent this temple was. And Artemis, uh, some say that the, the name comes because in that language, Artemis sounds like safe and sound. A goddess that provided some kind of security, safety and security. And may, many say she was a kind of uh, a goddess of fertility. A many-breasted woman is how some of the images of her are portrayed. A key to help people be fertile, whether that's children, that would enable your name to continue, and your household to have laborers and workers inside the household, whether that's crops. This goddess was one that provided for you, provided the ability for your means of production to be successful and to grow. She enabled you to be safe and sound. And all of us are prone to put our confidence or our trust in things that we think will provide for us. This is what the Bible refers to as worship. And therefore, worship is not just what Christians do when we sing, when Kung's leading us on a Sunday afternoon, though it is that too, and we love that. But worship is what we devote our time and our thinking and our trust and our confidence Monday to Saturday. We put our labors. And these people wanted to sacrifice, were willing to sacrifice to a deity who would provide for them through crops or children, various means of economic production. And every culture, friends, has some kind of a narrative to it and therefore puts their confidence in things as a result. In Singapore, there's a strong founding narrative in Singapore that this country is small, doesn't have any natural resources, 
And therefore, we are always afraid of not having enough. We have to save. We have to work very hard. And therefore, we save inordinate amounts of money. We put confidence in our financial balance sheets and positions. There's a fear of financial lack. And this means we, unlike, not, sorry, not dissimilar from those in Ephesus, are inclined to put our confidence and our trust in those things that provide for us financially and that will be productive for us too. And it's not a fertility god with many breasts at some temple, but it's education or hard work in our jobs or the size of our savings. Now, Chris Watkin, in his uh, wonderful book, Biblical Critical Theory, he shows us that right from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis like four, after, uh, after the fall, there's all these introductions of technology and culture that we begin to see. And in Genesis four to about seven, we see how many of these technologies are used in a way that is detached from God. And he begins to identify a shape to not only our work patterns, but our magic, the way that magic works out in the world, the way that false religions work out in the world, the way even that Christianity can get distorted when it gets so corrupted that it's no longer recognizable as being biblical Christianity, but yet is a form that many of us may be familiar with. And he talks about how all of these things, magic, false religion, distorted versions of Christianity, have an N shape to them, like the letter N. And it goes like this. We act in order for God to act for us. We're the prime mover. We initiate. We start things. We do things to get God's attention or make him happy or get him off our back or appease him for his anger, whatever form or shape it takes, and uh, kind of conjure some spirits or invoke some powers through magical chance. We act in order to get God to act for us and on our behalf. This is seen in our culture with sayings like no pain, no gain. Or that saying that some of you may even think is in the Bible, because some people quote it as being from the Bible, but it's not from the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. That's not a Bible verse. That's very far from Christianity. And as a result, we end up sacrificing to appease God or conjure up power or work hard What you put in is what you get out. And many of our lives, friends, are shaped this way, whether it's positively or negatively. Positively, we work hard. We trust in our jobs. If anything's going to threaten them, that's like a mortal threat to our lives because our jobs are no longer just a vocation through which we can glorify God. They wear our identity and our, our sense of future provision is all tied up into. We save like mad. We want to eradicate all the things in our, in our surroundings that could jeopardize prosperity. So this comes out in our parenting. And we are happy to eradicate our children's childhood by putting them through hours and hours of classes and tuition to remove all the stupidity from their minds and make sure they can already finish P2 before they even enter P1. They must be ahead. They've got to beat everyone else. Or maybe for others, friends, we don't even have children because if we fall pregnant and we're in the middle of our career or feel like we don't have enough economic stability, then we'll just terminate the child. I was reading this week about how there's a category of people in the world that are statistically the happiest people in the world. 99% surveyed were happy with their lives. 97% liked who they were. 96% of them liked how they looked. 99% of them expressed love for their families. Some of you are thinking, who on earth are these people? You know who these people are? They're people with Down syndrome. But you know more than 90% of them never get out the womb. And it's not because they're not going to have a miserable life. It's because we don't like what they're going to do to our life. Friends, what we trust in, what we worship, shapes our lives profoundly. 
and somebody always gets hurt when false worship happens. This is because if you look at that shape over there, God actually, or our means, or our deity, or magic, or whatever we're employing, is a means to our end. The self is at the end. We're at the end. We're just living for ourselves, and God becomes a means for us to get what we want, to make us happy. This is not, this is not worship of God. This is self-worship. Some of us convey, some of us conceive of Christianity this way. We just come to church to make sure God's not upset with us so we can, he can just leave us alone to either be successful or to help us to get successful. What we don't want is God. We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping ourselves. But every bit of worship comes at a cost, friends. Those in Ephesus sacrificed to the goddess of this temple and made offerings we're not 100% certain, but it seems like there were likely cult prostitutes there. People whose whole lives were given to satisfying the sexual desires of other people as part of some religious practices for fertility. Friends, false worship, people always get hurt. People always get hurt. In Singapore, friends, our love of money costs our families cost our children so much. Think about how society is structured. Think about foreign domestic workers. Think about migrant workers. I'm not saying in the new heavens and the new earth there may not be maids or foreign domestic workers. There could well be. But I don't think there will be tears. They won't be abused. They won't be misused. There will be joy and gladness. And there won't be income inequality. There certainly won't be widening income inequality. Friends, these things are present because we're trying to maximize efficiency and maximize productivity and maximize financial gain, and somebody is getting hurt. Friends, I know this sounds heavy. It is heavy. And I want you to know, I'm not here as some, you know, Ang Mo foreigner here to point fingers at Singapore and criticize it. I love this place. I love this place so much, I gave her my British passport and my South African passport to get a red passport. I'm a citizen. I'm committed. I'm talking to myself here. But we have to be able to, at some point, have some kind of self-critique, right? You see, friends, when money or finances is the way to make us feel safe and sound, then we'll justify anything for the sake of economic progress, financial stability, or productivity. Now, friends, the good news is Christianity is not like this. (laughs) You go back to, uh, not that slide yet. Christianity is not like this. If you go back to the passage before, these passages really are tied together, right? Because the riot at Ephesus we're going to get to in a moment comes out of what happened in the the, the verses before. And there's a clue, even in in these verses, that God is not like this. Because if you remember what was preached last Sunday, what happened was was, God was doing extraordinary miracles at the hand of Paul. And this was not because it was conjured up. It doesn't say Paul fasted for 60 days till he was like a shell of a man. And then God is like, okay, fine, you know, fine. I'll give some miracles. No, God is pouring out his blessing and his miracles. And people are realizing, who is this Jesus? And that's, let's turn, on, let's turn to our next slide and see well, what can says is that what we see in this passage and in Genesis and throughout the Bible is not an N-shaped Religion, but a U-shaped religion. God acts. God initiates. God intervenes. God comes. God takes on flesh. God comes to the cross in order that we may know him and worship him. God acts for our good that we may delight in him. So in this passage, extraordinary miracles are done at the hands of Paul. And what is the result? People begin to revere Jesus and worship him. Some monkeys try and manipulate the magic and they you know, get beaten and flee from the place naked and bleeding. I mean, it's rather comical. 
But the blessing that God is pouring out leads to what? It tells us in verse 18. It says, um, uh, the name, verse 17, fear came upon them all. The name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. What are we seeing in those verses? God acts, miracles, kindness, blessing, grace, healing, his kingdom coming. And what's the result? People respond to him. They, they, They revere Jesus. They worship him. They love him. And that's the shape of Christianity. We love him because why? We want him to love us or bless us? No, we love him because he first loved us. And this, friends, leads to worship. Not, the, not using God for our own sake. He's already acted for us. Now our hearts are given to him in love and adoration and worship. And we want to praise him and adore him and say, Jesus, we love you. There's no one like you. This, friends, this is where worship flows from our hearts. This is the shape of the gospel. This is Jesus giving himself for us in grace at the cross. A grace that turns our hearts to fear the Lord, to revere him, a holy love, a reverence, a trust in him, worshiping him for him. And the passage tells us that this fear of the Lord means some Christians go and burn their idols and magic arts. It's very, it's very fascinating. It says, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. They believed. Then some of them realized, man, we still, we still have some of these magic arts going on. But Jesus is revered and worshipped, and they say, wow. It's almost like, I don't know, the gospel settled at a deeper level. You know, like, I'm sure many of you have met people like this because you're all like, I mean, some of you, if you're married, you're married to someone like this, right? Every Christian is like this. There's a part of you that loves Jesus and worships him and adores him and praises him. And you can look at someone and think, man, they've like really been sanctified. They're really growing. Isn't it wonderful? But at the same time, you look at them and you're like, man, there's some really dark parts of their life. Some real blind spots, you know? Like some areas where it's like, do you even believe in Jesus? Now, often we're very blind to that. It seems like what happens here, sanctification is progressive, it's slow. But as we revere Jesus, as we see, as we worship him, suddenly they're like, hold on, we're holding on to these magic dark arts. Let's get rid of those. And they go and burn all of their stuff, about $10 million worth. They didn't sell it. They didn't put it on carousel. They weren't like, oh, we can't do, you know, we can't do magic anymore, so it's just like sell all our stuff, you know, $10 million on carousel. We'll, yeah, we'll give, we'll, we'll tithe, we'll tithe the million to the church. No, they just, they burn it. And th- there's clues here in verse 31, I think it talks about the Asiarchs. Some of you, they, oh, what are the Asiarchs? They were like a noble class, a wealthy group of people, incredibly wealthy and influential. They'd gathered around Paul. They were supporting him. They were there to, to help. They, 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 their lives and their wealth was now being used to, extend the kingdom. Something fundamental had shifted and changed inside of them. What happens, friends? They saw something of the reality of God. Jesus was revered. They worshipped him afresh. They saw him as safe and sound. As amazing grace says, it was grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, to revere God, God's kindness. The U-shaped God acts. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. God's goodness to us at the cross relieves our fears. Friends, the point here is the good news of grace, of God's grace, disrupts what we worship. But we're going to see it not only disrupts what we worship, it disrupts a city's systems of worship. In verse 21, we see Demetrius now uh, responds to this. And what's fascinating is Demetrius responds... And essentially what happens is he gets upset because he realizes there are so many Christians turning to the faith and no longer worshiping pagan gods that his business is going to suffer economically. That's what happens. Now, he's going to make a long speech, and, but the way he starts, I think, really reveals his heart. Later on, you'll say, oh, Artemis is this great god. She is, she's going to lose her magnificence. She's worshiped all over the world. They're leading people to not worship her anymore. But what's really going on, I think, inside of Demetrius' heart is seen in verse 23 to 25. It'll be up on the slide now. 
It says, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. So all these guys, there's an industry there, and they're all making these idols. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know from this business we have our wealth. In other words, you know what's paying the bills. Now, when, Paul, when, when all these guys in verse 19 burnt $10 million worth of shrines and magic arts and all their books, there was no one crying out. Demetrius wasn't like, oh my gosh, you're dishonoring Artemis. You're like upsetting all these gods. No, he, he doesn't care. But the minute his pocket is touched, whew, now there's hell to pay. Now he's enraged. Now there's going to be a riot. Again, Artemis, friends, is a, a god to help them get what they really want, their own security, their safety. That's what he's living for. That's what he wants. And when something disrupts that, he's furious. So, and what we see, friends, is when the true worship of Jesus begins to break out in a city, it disrupts some of the systems, some of the industries, some of the the ways that things are done in that city. In other words, as these Christians begin to truly worship Jesus, as they give their hearts to him, as they are further sanctified, they, those who are part of this system begin to opt out. They're like, oh, we can't participate in this anymore. We can't participate in that anymore. So many are beginning to worship Jesus that it affects entire industries built on false worship. The amazing stories about the Welsh revival that happened about 120 years ago spread through Wales, all these villages, And people say bars and gambling houses closed due to lack of business. There was no one to go there anymore. Prostitution ceased. Courthouses were closed because there were no criminal cases to try. I know we have a lot of lawyers here. We even have prosecutors here, I think. I mean, imagine you're just sitting around all day. It's like, what are you going to do all day? There's a particularly amusing account of where there were coal mines and the coal miners ran into trouble. Do you know why they ran into trouble? You're thinking, how does the ri- a revival affect a coal mine? Because the coal miners use such filthy and foul language to instruct the donkeys that used to pull the carts in the mines that when they all got converted and they started speaking language that wasn't um, littered with all these vulgarities, the donkeys didn't understand them anymore. It's, it's documented. They had to retrain their animals in the mines. So let's stop. I mean, isn't that amazing? <laughs> isn't that incredible? I mean, don't you hear that and think, come, Lord Jesus. Come, oh, Lord Jesus, come to Singapore. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. R- revive us. Friends, what industries would not be here anymore? What would look different? I'm not a cultural expert here. I'm not here to point fingers and critique different parts of our culture. But, friends, Jesus can lead you to think through these things. Think about the way some people are treated. Think about those who are getting hurt in our society. Think about the 900 kids in foster care who don't have homes to be placed in in Singapore. I don't think they would be in that situation. There'd be homes, people would open up their homes. I mean, they, I mean, how many Christians are there in Singapore? Hundreds of thousands, right? Does every Christian have to take in a foster child? No. But could there possibly, out of hundreds of thousands of homes, be 900 that are willing to take in kids and just draw, you know, put everyone at a home? Yeah, uh, surely. Friends, we pray for a revival. We pray for, we can as Christians, we pray for non-Christians to be converted and to come to know Jesus. We really want that. I think Christians should be somewhat engaged in the political process. We live in a pluralistic society. We we speak, we don't get to demand what the laws of our country are, but we can tell our elected representatives and our government and vote in a way that's in line with our values and, and 
decides things based on what we think will lead to the flourishing of our country. That's part of our responsibility as citizens. You have political inroads, you know people, you, you, we, we can engage all of those things, and we can and should. Our ultimate hope is not in those things, but by all means do so. But what's amazing about this text is that, ironically, interestingly enough, it's when believers turn from their idolatry that the city begins to get di- disrupted. When we stand in fear of Jesus and worship him wholeheartedly, when we start to say, look, I'm not just going to live the way every other Singaporean lives and pursue all the same gods and live exactly the same way because that's just how we live in Singapore, but we say, hold on, what does it mean for me to raise my kids, think about my career, manage my finances, whatever it is, how do I actually really stand in fear of Jesus? How do I live in, how do I worship him? Friends, Singapore needs some people to say, I love Jesus enough that I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. The point is, in this passage, transformation happens as Christians turn from their idols, follow Jesus wholeheartedly, no longer co-opting the systems of this world. That means the call in this passage is not just to wag fingers at all your non-Christian, you know, your colleagues, your boss, all these non-Christian, all these bad people. Of course we pray for them to come to faith and and know Jesus. But the the primary call here is, are we worshiping Jesus? Are we serving him? Now this good news, the good news is fruit here. Interesting, it's both resisted and recognized. We don't have a, a lot of time here. But it is resisted because they, they start a riot. When their idol of, of their financial stability is affected, Demetrius is held to pay. He's enraged, verse 26 tells us. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the cry was filled with, and so the city was filled with the confusion. Actually, the word confusion is mentioned twice. It's like a, there's like an irrational kind of rage and anger here. Just a side note, that's an interesting way to just self-diagnose what kind of idolatry is at work in your own heart. The things that you get very angry about very quickly and set you off. You're a very chill guy, you know, but someone touches this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's another side of you. And there's this resistance. And friends, we must just settle that there will be some resistance that we're going to face in following Jesus. Some of us will need to grow a slightly thicker skin, get used to being re- resisted. Some of us need to make some decisions and pay a price. Uh, early adopters of opting out of any system never are thanked by the society for doing so. I remember when we came here 15 years ago and some people were beginning to kind of explore homeschooling. Should we homeschool, shouldn't we? So you're like, homeschool? What's wrong with you? So weird. Very, very hard to do. Now, I'm not saying following Jesus means that you homeschool your kids. I have three kids. I'm about to go through my third PSLE this year. We're in the system. You can follow Jesus faithfully in the school system, no problem. But, I mean, every family's got to think and pray, right? And decide what, what are your values? How do you want to, what's best for your kids, etc.? Sure. But maybe for some of us, we're just we're coasting in the system in such a seamless way that no, there's no resistance at all. No one's even looking at us like, why do you make decisions that you make? Our lives just look exactly like everyone else in the city. There's no resistance. Why is this? Is this possibly that we are just very firmly committed to our magic arts on the side? Oh, worship Jesus on Sunday, of course. But I mean, Monday to Saturday, man's got to do what a man's got to do, Right? Is that how we think? But there's also a clue here that something of what they saw was recognized. Sorry, something of what God was doing there was recognized. It's a, it's a very slight indication. But what happens is there's this uproar and a confusion and this riot in the city. And suddenly the town clerk um, has to try and get some order in the town. And it tells us in verse 35 that he quietens down the crowd and then gives a speech. It's interesting. Firstly, what he says to them is he says, 
Don't you know the city of Ephesus is a temple keep of the great Artemis, the sacred stone that fell from the sky. These things cannot be denied. You ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. He's like saying to them, why, in a sense, he's saying, why are you guys overreacting here? Like if this deity is so great, and if the story is true that like this is this deity and she fell from the sky and we have a great temple here, she's been worshipped for hundreds of years, why, are you, like, what's going on? He's saying there's something irrational about what you're doing. He recognizes there's something else driving this. It's not pure devotion and worship to Artemis. There's something that doesn't add up here. It's like there's some light that's beginning to pierce through in the situation. And what's even more interesting is in verse 40, he says, For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. He basically saying to all these rioters, Listen, you, and sorry, what's fascinating is that the same language he uses there for rioting and commotion he is the language that Demetrius and all of his buddies used to accuse Paul of, saying Paul is upsetting the city. This guy is saying, listen, you're accusing Paul of this. What has Paul done? Paul's done nothing. Paul doesn't cause a riot in the city. But look at the way you're behaving. You're the ones that are in danger of actually getting charged. You're the ones causing this confusion and this uproar in the city here. In other words, friends, there are indications here that there, there's, there's some recognition that this system that they are living in and building and, and defending is not quite holding together. Now, some of us could say, well, did this recognition of the town clerk like, you know, cause so many in Ephesus to fall to their knees and repent and worship Jesus? Doesn't seem like it. Not a huge amount. Did some recognize? Probably. Paul writes uh, to a thriving church in Ephesus later on. No doubt many came to faith after this. Many believers there. Ephesians chapter 2, Jew and Gentile together as one. God is at work. But it's not like the whole city suddenly converted. Did this point that this guy, the clerk, is making land on everyone? Did everyone repent? No. You ask me, okay, I'm preaching this way. We, we want to see Singapore transformed. How optimistic am I? Am I a transformationalist? If we just pray and fast enough, will this whole city just fall to their knees and worship Jesus? They will one day fall to their knees and worship Jesus when he comes back. But probably not until then. How much can we achieve here? I don't know. But I know what we're called to do. We're called to love Jesus and worship him and preach his gospel and live as a, a countercultural community. Friends, the church is called to be an outpost of the kingdom of God here in our city. That means people walk into the church and they think people treat each other differently here. There's rich and poor. There's, they are not treating each other the way that relationships work outside. And the people who discover there's a mum here who's got two or three young children and a husband and things are very difficult at home and he doesn't come to church and she's struggling and they begin to love her and fold her in and serve her. And people walk in full of shame and they find the people embracing them and loving them. And we realize no one's getting hurt. Some people could get hurt because, man, we're not perfect. But people aren't getting hurt. Jesus is being worshipped and people are being loved. People are being cared for. No one's been taken advantage of. We're pouring ourselves out for one another. And this begins to get seen and recognized. It's what we're called to be, friends. God has been so gracious to us as a church. There's so much about our church that I'm so proud of and I love and I'm so grateful to God for. Yet there's so much more for us, friends. But we're going to get better and healthier, not by pointing fingers at the world, saying, oh, you sort yourself out, the government, they don't know what they're doing, or whatever. No. We're going to get healthy as we worship the one true God, as we worship Jesus, as we love him. We give him our heart. How shall we live in the light of this? Friends, we need to identify personal and cultural idols and worship Jesus wholeheartedly. 
we do need to identify cultural idols. The problem with cultural idols is that you can't see them because you just grew up like that. It's like everyone's like that. So you need people from outside to help you see or to mirror back or ask you questions. It's really helpful for me to come here from another culture because when I came to Singapore, I realized, oh, there's some things about my culture that I realized were not very godly. I came to Singapore, I realized I was completely lawless. I had no respect for the law at all. Now, in South Africa, it's like no one takes the law seriously. It's like, it's like a guideline. I mean, you, you, you kind of, I mean, don't do anything too serious. Don't hurt people too badly. But it's like, I mean, I mean that, that's just how life works there. Eh? You make a plan. When we came here, we didn't have money to buy a car, so I got a scooter. I used to ride around meeting people. Friends, I don't want to tell you how much money I spent on traffic fines in my first year here. It's embarrassing. Parking fines. Like, why are they so pedantic about where you park? It's a two-wheeled scooter. I mean, what does it matter? Just week after week, these fines coming in. Oh, my gosh. I was like, I mean, only after months that I realized, you know what? I actually have to, like, learn the system and the rules and the, the painting and, like, where I actually can and can't park. It didn't even cross my line to try and figure it out when I arrived because you didn't even have to worry about those things in South Africa. But I realized I have, like, a lawlessness to me. Then I realized... You know, the way that I, like Westerners view our parents, it's like we don't even have a category for honoring our parents properly. Wow, in Asia, you realize, I think people understand what the Bible says about honoring parents far better. Coming to another culture made me suddenly realize, oh, there, there are things that I just do or think in a very unthinking way that are not normal, actually, or should be checked. If I came to Singapore, I, I was stunned by some things in the culture here. I mean, how much confidence people put in money and savings. Do PMC with people, they're talking about life savings and what they have, and they're like, you know, 20 something, and they've got like X amount in the bank, and they're panicking about it. They don't have enough. I'm like, <coughs> like, like choking on my, on my dinner. Excuse me? How much money do you have? Yeah, yeah, I've only got like X amount. I don't know if I can get married now. And I'm waiting. I'm so worried. Oh, so, sorry. You have that and you're anxious? You're like worried you don't have enough? Like, what, what kind of a world is, is this? When RHC had like a surplus in our bank account after a couple of months, I was like, we're going to have to give this away. I mean, our church in South Africa, we never had a surplus one year ever that I was there. Ne- never. The church has lived in overdraft for the, all the years that I was there. Never, ever had a surplus. And then people are like, no, we must save for a rainy day. So we're like, you know what? Okay, we, we, we're going to literally like make a law. The elders are going to pass a law in this church. We cannot have more than six months reserves. It's like, no, we, we just don't adopt that kind of thinking that like we just keep saving more and more and more for a rainy day. Uh, no, Jesus is alive. He promises to, to take care of us. Friends, but we need to help one another see some of these things. It's actually one of the blessings about being in a, in a, multi, in a, in a church that has a diversity of people. I know we're majority Singaporean here. I love that about our church. But I also love the fact we're not only like monocultural. And people have often told me, they go to a CG and first they were like, oh gosh, they're people from different backgrounds and it wouldn't be easy if they were all just like me. But then they start to see the faith through someone else's eyes and they realize their own cultural assumptions and how they read texts and they, it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much richer. This is, this is beautiful. And we can pray, we can ask, Lord, Lord, search me and know my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Friends, all of us need this. Jesus had to write back to this church in Revelation 2 and 3 and say, hey, Ephesian church, you guys have lost your first love. This, this is true of all of us. Friends, maybe some of us today do need to divulge our, our practices. We need to confess them, get them out. Confess sins, fears, confidences, trusts we, we've had. But I I don't want to end there. I want to end by urging us to worship Jesus wholeheartedly. Worship Jesus wholeheartedly. In verse 30, Paul um, actually has to be held back by these Asiarchs from rushing into the riot to explain and to preach the gospel to them. These guys are like, look, we appreciate your boldness, but I mean, there's also wisdom, Paul. Like, you're super bold, but can you maybe be wise? Like, don't you? You could die if you go in there. Now, in Singapore, I think most of us probably err more on the side of wisdom, right, than boldness. 
hmm, let's think about this. You know, I find in so many meetings I'm in, it's like the most conservative view wins the day all the time. I don't know if we should do that. Let's think about this a little bit more. Maybe we can be a little bit more conservative. Like, mm, 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 let's be conservative. Let's be wise. Okay, great. We're all wise here. Can we have a little bit of boldness, please? Can we believe that Jesus is alive? He rose from the dead. That's Paul. Why? Paul sees Jesus. He, he's seen the risen Christ. He worships him. He adores him wholeheartedly. And so he's like all in. He's all in. Friends, the point here is not like the sermon is not like, hey, you search for all your idols and you repent of them all and you get rid of those idols. Yes, that is the point. But the point is you're going to be helped in displacing your idols by worshiping Jesus. When the things of this world, your idols, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Some of us are spending all our time staring at our idols. We never look at Jesus and then we're like, Oh, so, oh, my idol is money. I love money so much. I'm like, I'm always counting my money. I've got to like repent of my love for money. And I, you know, you, do you know I've like struggled with like money? I, you know, it's like I need comfort from money. And I know there's like killers, four things, approval, comfort. What's the control? Something else, power. It's like, you know, all this is money for me. Is you just looking at money all the time? You'll never get free of it. Worship Jesus. Worship Jesus. See Jesus. See, Jesus, this U-shaped dynamic, he came down, not a stone from heaven. He came down. He took on flesh for you. He initiated. He said, I, I love you. And so, you know what? For some of you, he did that knowing what a rot, not some of you, all of you, all of us, knowing what a rotten sinner you are. Friends, I know I alluded earlier to abortion. It's not the unforgivable sin. It's grievous. It's not unforgivable. If you're here today, if, you, if, you, if you're racked with a sense of guilt about anything you've done, maybe you're a man, you never took responsibility for someone. You pressured your girlfriend into doing something like that. And Jesus, friend, sees into your dark heart deeper than you have seen it. He sees that, he knows that, and he says, I'll initiate. I'll initiate. Before the, before the foundation of this world, I'll come and take on flesh I'll, I'll suffer and die. I'll bleed on a Roman cross for Simon Murphy, chief of sinners at RHC. I'll bleed and die for this person, that person. He, he loves you, friends. And he acts for your good in grace so that you can love him and worship him and turn to him. Jesus never profited from our idolatry yeah, in, 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 in our idolatry, someone does get hurt. Jesus got hurt. Jesus got hurt, friends. He went to that cross so that we can live in a flourishing relationship with him and know him and worship him. So I want to urge us this afternoon, I want to urge us to worship him, to worship him. To, to find what you need to do to cultivate a sense of affection and love in your heart for God. Read through the Gospels. Pray. Before you read your Bible, God, help the scales to fall from my eyes. Your the Bible's boring to me. God, I'm sorry. It feels that way. Forgive me. Spirit, fill me. Make, make my heart alive to you. Just be honest with Him. Begin to worship Him. Pray to Him. Cultivate a sense of affection and love in our hearts for Him. Friends, we don't just want to be a church that is pointing out and scolding everyone for their idolatry. We want to be a church where we're known for our love for Jesus. Every now and again, it's like, whoops, discovered this little magic arts in my, this section of my life. Whoopsie daisy. Maybe quickly repent of that and get rid of that. All right, back to worshiping Jesus. Friends, maybe there's some here this afternoon and you need to turn to him now. Maybe you're here today, you're not a Christian. You've had questions, doubts, uncertainty about the faith. Jesus stands before you today, inviting you to put your faith in him, to receive what he's done for you. He's died for your sins. He's risen again. He stands at the door of your heart to, to knock. He said, put your faith in me. For those of us who are here who, who are Christians, Friends, can I urge us to give our hearts to Jesus wholeheartedly today? To, to pray sincerely, Lord, search me and know me. If there's any offensive way in me, 
lead me in the way everlasting. Can we do that today? Let's close our eyes and pray. Father, we ask that you would And draw us to yourself, to see you afresh, to love you and worship you. Not to manipulate you or use you to get what we want at the end of the day, but to truly delight in you and to worship you. Lord, won't you work in us? Father, as the lead pastor of this church, I ask you that you would revive my heart. That you would deepen my affections for you. That you would fill me with your love. You would fill me with the joy of knowing you. You put a deeper hunger in my heart for you. And I pray this not just for myself, but for every person here. Jesus name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.